Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 88. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy. Today on the show, we have someone quite different to the typical Lend Academy podcast guest, but I'm delighted to welcome Hardeep Walia, who's the founder and CEO of Motif. Now, Motif have nothing to do with marketplace lending, at least directly. They are disrupting a different area of finance. They're disrupting equity investing. And as you'll find in the interview, there's actually a lot of similarities. I think their investor profile would be very similar to the investor profile of the typical lending club or prosper investor. So the thing that's different about Motif is that they allow investors to invest in equities based around a certain theme. Now, we get into that in some depth in this show. We also talk a lot about the challenge of scaling a business of this kind, whether to go focus on retail investors, whether to focus on institutional investors. We talk about profitability. We talk about IPOs and all sorts of other things. It's a fascinating company, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Hardeep. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So why don't we get started and give the listeners a little bit of background about yourself and and what you did before you started Motif? Uh, How far back do you want to go? So (laughs) I I guess I I have an undergrad from Yale in engineering and economics. I then jumped off and, and entered the, the consulting world. I was a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group for a number of years. And then when, when kind of Circa Netscape happened, there was a lot of excitement in the internet. Mm-hmm. And so I jumped into the software space. I worked at a number of startups. Uh, to be honest, none of them did really well. And so to take my vengeance, I joined Microsoft, <laughs> where my first job was buying distressed startups. And, uh, and I worked on a lot of emerging businesses. I was in their corp dev team. And and after that, I, I was general manager of their enterprise services business. So made it uh, not 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 didn't hit the seven year ish. My my itch, I guess, was six and a half years right. at Microsoft, and uh, and then took a leave of absence. And during that time, uh, came up with the idea for Motif. Okay, so just tell us a little bit about that and why. Well, firstly, what what Motif does exactly, and why why you started it. So everyone's got kind of their own eccentricity. One of my eccentricities is uh, when I go through tough times, I like to trade stocks. And people go, Doesn't that, isn't that exactly the point when you're not supposed to be? And for me, it forces a state of zen and calm, nothing like cold-hearted calculus and numbers and to get your mind off things. And so uh, during my, my time off, and it was due to my wife not being well at the time, I, I wanted to invest in things I understood. And, and, and really the first problem was I wanted to invest in the mobile internet. And I do what any Wharton grad does is I pick up the phone, call my friends on Wall Street and said, how do you invest in the mobile internet? And, and I wasn't very uh, pleased with their answers. It was typically buy Google, buy Apple. And this is circa 2009, 2008. So the iPhone had, had come out uh, earlier, but you know, it really didn't give you true exposure to the mobile internet. And when I went to my friends on Sand Hill Road, how do you invest in the mobile internet? You know, their their notion was, well, we've got all these private investments, but as an individual investor, you know, trying to figure out how to, to invest in the mobile internet was actually quite hard. And most people didn't come up with things like the cell phone tower companies that do well, whether Apple or, or Google wins the handset or um, the, the, the chip companies, the touch companies. And really to to get true exposure to something like the mobile internet, uh, you needed at least 30 securities. And to try and, and buy them at a traditional online broker, you know, $10 a trade at the time, you know, that, that was just a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the big aha actually had nothing to do with the mobile internet. The, the big aha was people naturally think conceptually about investing and they can express to different degrees of complexity what it is they want to do. The hard part was acting on those expressions. And, and you know, these expressions can take a couple of forms. They can be somatic, and we've built a, a good reputation in that area. You know, I live in Silicon Valley. I've got drones flying over my house every weekend. I know the drones are coming. I want them to invest in drones, but I don't know how. That's a traditional thematic expression. They can be trading models. I, I, I like to buy beaten down stocks because I believe when people panic sell, that's 
kind of a good time to go look at an individual stock, but I don't have time to track the market. So wouldn't it be great if someone out there could just go buy beaten down stocks for me? Uh, so that's more of a trading expression, mm-hmm. or they can be completely passive. You know, I, I want to emulate the investing behavior. My old professor at Yale, who Dave Swenson, is having another great year running Yale's endowment. I don't know anything about investing. I just want to emulate what he does. So what we do at Motif is we allow people to act on these expressions by turning them into what we call a motif. And a motif, very simply, it is a somatically weighted basket of up to 30 stocks built around one of these expressions. And you can purchase a motif in a single click for the cost of a single stock transaction. So $9.95 to buy a basket of 30 stocks in real time. So our, our, our customers think of motifs as kind of customizable, no fee ETFs. But unlike an ETF, you actually own the underlying securities. And, right. and so you can buy one of our motifs. You can buy, uh, you can build your own motif. In fact, we have a royalty program. If, if someone else buys your motif, we, we pay you a royalty. Uh, and so what it's done is, uh, you know, I took our, our PSU the year to build, a, uh, I think, 100 motifs in our first year. And our customers built 85,000 motifs. Uh, I think today there are over 320,000 motifs built. And these are all people thinking about, you know, mo- you know, investing in a very conceptual, a very natural, almost human way of thinking about investing. And you've been amazed at the amount of ideas uh, that you see on our platform. Yep, yeah, I, I was I was poking around there um, yesterday in preparation for this interview, and I, I was, you know, you could, you know, like there was one motif, the future of fintech, which is obviously something that I'm very interested in. And, you know, it had a whole range of different companies in there. And, and I know I, I could obviously go and follow that and, and or I could, I could actually go and use that motif and purchase it. But so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about how you decide, like, if I say you for, for the drones, for example, and because not, I mean, not every company is going to have drone in their name and not every company is going to be obviously into drones. So you type in drones, how do you decide what companies to present to, to your investor? Yeah, so think of, of Motif as kind of a, a Peter Lynch meets a Jack Bogle, right? Okay. So we don't pick individual names. We build indices around each concept. So in the notion of a drone, we would actually go in and build an index of, you know, more than 30 companies, could be 50, 60 companies that have exposure to drones. And, and, and depending, each model is done very differently. In the case of drones, we would do we would look at like what percent of a company's revenue is really derived from drones, and then we might revenue adjust the market cap. Uh, if we had a shale gas motif, for example, we do we would we would weight it by the reserves in the ground because that's what really you're trying to to get exposure to. If you're doing a buyback motif, we would uh, weight it by the buyback yield. So each each weighting methodology of the index is really designed to give you exposure to the underlying theme. And, and a motif really is a sample of up to 30 stocks that track the risk return behavior of the bigger index that we manage. So we, we build these master indices, and then a motif is a sample that tracks the risk return. Much like when you buy uh, a, a Russell 3000 ETF, you don't always own 3000 stocks. You own a sample of stocks that minimize tracking error with the index. Mm-hmm. We've got a very similar model uh, and so it really is kind of an index approach to thematic investing versus trying to pick winners and losers. So we've got a, a top-down approach versus trying to guess which stock will do it. And and these indices are not static. We rebalance them. We update if there's a new company going in or if all of a sudden a particular company gets greater exposure to a theme. We adjust those periodically, typically quarterly. But we have some trading models, for example, by, by the dip for example, mm-hmm. you know, that might rebalance weekly as it looks to find more opportunities. So we, we really are about this concept-driven investing. So we do have passive models. We have asset allocation models. Uh, but we do also have a, a pretty large university of thematic models. Mm-hmm. So then just, just so I'm clear, I'd like to just use the drone example, the drone um, motif, people who, who want to buy that, are they all getting the same 30 30- underlying 30 stocks or, or are you taking like a random sample? I mean, how does it work? No, they're getting the same 30 stocks. So if you own the benchmark motif, everyone owns the same product. And, and we do allow you to, 
tweak it and customize it. Right. So if you have a different view on Amazon's uh, role to play in the drone world, if you want to weight it more, you can go do that. And that's when we go back to think of these as kind of like customizable ETFs. That's where the customization, and in that case, you have a custom version of our drone index, for example. And, and, and for, for certain ideas that don't have you know, a good selection of stocks, we don't always put them out there, right? So we don't have a drone motif right now, for example. But there are ones in the community that are built that where, where you have a certain people taking a view on, on, on a certain sector of stocks. We like to build index models that give you good coverage and good exposure versus trying to, to pick a handful of stocks. Right, right. So, so, but, but, but having said that, you know, you are, you're allowing people to do it because I'm just thinking about, you know, people like the future of fintech motif that I was looking at. And, you know, some of those companies, if I was to invest in it, I said, I wouldn't want that company in there. I don't think they've really got a good future. And, and others that weren't in there, I would want to add. So, in which case, you have, so you really have a couple of different ways of doing it. You can use sort of this index approach, which is what you've been talking about, or for the, for the very you know self-directed you know you know investor who says you know what I want my future of fintech motif and I want exactly these thirty stocks and that's what I'm going to create. So either way is 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 totally fine and they're both you know they're both like nine ninety five right? That's correct. And and I think one of the interesting things that we we released last year is basically and, and we're pushing natural search pretty aggressively. So now if you go to try and build a motif prior to the middle of last year you'd actually have to do some homework. You'd have to go out and do some homework, research which fintech companies or which drone companies you wanted to put in your, your respective motif. Now you can actually type in search. You can type in something like virtual reality into our search box and, and it literally scour the web and pull up the most relevant stocks. And, and you can very quickly in a matter of seconds actually build your motif using search. Huh. Uh, and it's a pretty powerful search tool and, and it allows you to take out some of the complexity of build. That was a request from our customer saying, you know, I, I, I'm spending a lot of time building a motif. Are there anything you can do to help us discover stocks that we may not have thought of? So we've got this and, and where it's in beta, but it's pretty accurate. And so you can type in a concept, an idea, and then actually try to build a motif on the fly in, right down to even thematically waiting it for you. Right. And so, and, and, just so I'm, I want to be 100% clear here, he said it's 995, and then you could own this motif for five years, and there's no annual fee. Is that correct? I mean, like obviously with an ETF or or a mutual fund, there's a, there's a fee that, that they're going to take out every year. So I'm just I just want to make sure if you own this for a number of years, and and, and obviously you are some you are you know buying and selling inside that motif to reflect the uh, the underlying index so uh, is there, is there any other pro, any other cost after the 995 so there there is a 995 to buy the motif if you decide to make changes to the motif uh, it will cost you 995 and there is a 495 if you elect to rebalance so if you left the motif static mm-hmm. it would be 995 and you're done okay. but if you decided and if you built your own motif it's 995 and you're done uh, okay. If you decided to follow one of our rebalances uh, that are typically quarterly, there's a 495 charge. Okay. However, we we have a subscription model where for ten dollars a month, uh, you can invest in as many motifs as you like, as frequently as you like, and it only costs you ten dollars. And that includes all of the rebalancing, all of the automatic investing, and so that that's for people who uh, are building wealth and want predictable costs. Uh, we launched a subscription in November of last year called Motif Blue. And then you're not in the more the transactional model. You're in the I'll pay a subscription and I, I want predictability. And, I, and now you can actually, uh, for $10 a month, invest regularly in, in, in anything you want, mm-hmm. including your own models. Right. So why did, why did you choose the 30 limit? Was that arbitrary or was that something that I was imagine it wasn't arbitrary, but what was the reasoning behind keeping it at 30? Well, I mean, it, the honest truth is the first motif we built just happened to be 30 stocks. <laughs> so, uh, it is so we started from that. And then we, as we did usability studies, we realized if you put 50, 60 stocks, people start to lose interest. Right. If you put 10, 10 stocks, you're, you're not really diversified enough. Right. 
And so, you know, it was kind of like Goldilocks, 30 felt right. And then we built the economic model uh, around the 30 stocks. Okay. And nothing stops us from going in. And we, we thought, you know, about opening that, that limit. But really, most people are buying multiple motifs to fulfill a wealth strategy or a goal. And so, you know, 30 seems to be about right. Okay. So then who, is, who are the, your investors? Are these, you know, typically young professionals? I mean, who, who do you find coming on your platform? So we, uh, our early adopters, I honestly got this wrong, were ultra high net worth retirees. Hmm. Um, I thought we, our early adopters would be millennials. Right. So uh, and I. <laughs> now we've kind of branched, uh, branched away. Uh, that was a good problem to have, by the way. I, but the, I think now we've, uh, our, our median age is kind of high 30s of our customers. And we, we call our customers motifers. We've got you know, over 300,000 now. And, and I think they fall into a couple of distinct segments. We've got you know, a, a group that just like to trade stocks. And what they like about our platform is you can trade stocks for four ninety five, but you can also dollar invest in real time. So, you know, if you wanted to buy exactly five thousand dollars of Apple, you can do it a motif where you couldn't do it at a generic online broker, mm-hmm. right? Because they force you to buy whole shares and hundred lots, and and so that just that intuitive nature. But we've got we've got a, a big segment there. But the majority of our segment are are, are do it yourself investors that want to do their own investing, want to build their own wealth models. And they don't typically like a robo model, for example, where they give you one asset model and, and that's pretty much it. Here on our, our platform, you have lots of different asset models. So even if you're building a wealth model and you want to keep it simple, we, we give you choice and we give you the ability to customize it as well. And so that, that tends to be our big thing. And then we have uh, some ultra high net worth investors who like to put their play money on our platform. Uh, and those are kind of the, the three big segments for us. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And, and so then what can you share like total assets that you is going through your platform now, or is that private information? We, we, we keep it private. Some of it's governed by NDAs because we've got some partnerships. And so we just kept that private for now. And, and, but we do release our number of motifers, uh, and, and we're in also 300, 320,000. Right, right. Right. Okay. Okay. So then, as... and, and this is, this is kind of the, this is our retail business. Right. Uh, we do have an institutional business that we launched last year. Yeah. I was going to get to and, that. <laughs> and we're, what we, what we do there is we, we, our focus is thematic models and we build more sophisticated global indices with, partnering with large financial institutions, and then we work with them to sell it to their clients and their partners. So we have, we announced a deal uh, with Goldman Sachs, for example, where we partner with them to build uh, motifs, but we, we, we embed them in structured notes issued by Goldman Sachs, and then Goldman will sell it to their partners and their clients. We uh, just launched in November of last year, uh, a deal with Global Atlantic, where we manage three variable uh, annuity mutual funds for them. And, and again, these are thematic models. That's our expertise. And, and everything we do, we, you know, our, our magic is making investing more intuitive using technology and using thematic models. So everything we do on our institutional side is thematic. And then even with, uh, you know, U.S. Bank, they're a client of ours where we, in their SMA models for their ultra high net worth group, Ascent, I think their minimum account size is like, 100 or 200 million. So this is like the ultra high net worth investor. We build thematic models for them and we deploy it in their SMA accounts. And we build models that are just hard to to come by, right? Where you need a lot of technology to build them. So these are not traditional models. I'll give you an example that they've made public, for example, uh, the reorganization of American cities. Mm -hmm. How do you invest in that? And what we're trying to do is build models that are just very unique, very differentiated, because it is a competitive marketplace. And we build them uh, predominantly using technology versus teams of analysts. And that's kind of our, our expertise. And that's what we bring to our institutional business. Okay. So then who, who do you see as your main competitors? Because, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's not like I've, I've you stumble across many companies doing the exact same thing you are. Well, I don't know of any, to be honest. So who, who do you see as your main competitors? Well, there are a lot of clones of ours, uh, especially in China. 
uh, right, for some reason. <laughs> One of them was called motifinvesting.net. Uh, that, uh, that actually had my picture on their homepage. So uh, that was that a is long so story on how we have to get that one shut down. Yes. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, you know, I, I mean, we are an online broker, but we're, we're more of a specialty store versus a supermarket. Right. Uh, so we, we, we focus on our motifs on, you know, making investing intuitive. Uh, and we don't try to do everything. Right, because I think it, it can get, you can get very lost in a traditional online broker, uh, but we are a, a registered broker dealer or FINRA registered dealer. So for us, obviously, other online brokers uh, would be a competitor set for us. Um, and then you know, to the extent that your your alternative is kind of an ETF, this is kind of almost how the next generation of ETFs will play in. So we kind of play in that intersection of the online broker and the ETF world. And we do use ETFs. I mean, we, we use fixed income ETFs on our platform. You can buy any ETF. Uh, so we're not directly competitive, but our, our main competitor set would be in the online brokerage space. Right, right. Okay. Interesting. So so then I, I also read about something that you did with JP Morgan and IPOs. Is Could you tell us, Is that was, I think it was just a few months ago, that you're helping people now participate in IPOs. What Can you tell us a little bit about that service? Yeah. Again, the theme of Motif is how do we use technology to make investing more intuitive? Mm -hmm. And we also try to make investing accessible, accessible by having a lower price point. You know, to buy a Motif at a traditional online broker would cost you $300 and you couldn't dollar invest. So we bring down the cost. And as you pointed out earlier, there are no ongoing BIPs that eat at your returns like a traditional ETF model. Uh, And we took that approach to the IPO market, which we wanted to open it up, make it more accessible, and, and, and our friends at J.P. Morgan also have the same goal of doing that. And what we do is we allow people to participate in an IPO, but we take a lot of the complexity out. So we walk you through the process of what it takes to participate in an IPO, and then we allocate shares. So we did our first one in December, Trivago, and we've, we've also we started to offer Reg A Plus IPOs, and our goal is to make investing accessible and it really is about giving people access to products they might not be able to get through the traditional model and we we partner with jp morgan we'll be partnering with other underwriters later this year to give people access uh, but but not just giving them access but but making it very easy to to go through an ipo process and and get shares allocated Mm -hmm. Okay. And so and even now you can dollar invest for an IPO. If you wanted to participate in an IPO, you could dollar invest and we walk you through all the paperwork that you need to do to participate. So you can dollar invest and we actually don't charge you commissions on that. Uh, so you get to participate and you get in on the IPO price, which is pretty exciting for some investors. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds great. That sounds great. So you mentioned fixed income ETFs just a little bit ago, and I wanted to talk about the fixed income side. A lot of the listeners uh, you know, fixed income investors. So, I mean, I presume you're, or, or let me just, do you participate in like publicly traded fixed income securities as well as equities? No, it's on our radar. There's some work we have to do on our end. I mean, one of our goals is to actually offer fixed income motifs as well, right? Today we use ETFs, but we use them in with a kind of a management overlay. So, for example, we have a fixed maturity ladder motif and you can look up and, and it's, we use fixed maturity ETFs, but you know, just like we talked about customization, you can actually tweak the portfolio pretty easily if you wanted to change the duration of that fixed income portfolio, or if you had a, a, a credit portfolio of fixed income and you wanted to change the risk model on that. So we do some interesting things, even when we use ETFs as building blocks, mm-hmm. So we, we, we're, 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 that's something we're focused on doing. And then as we do that, we'll start to think about, you know, bond issuers and, and things like that. That's not something we offer right now. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So then, you know, you've, uh, you've raised, you know, you've raised uh, $126 million, I see. And you've actually got some, many of the same investors that are in the marketplace lending space, you know, like Foundation Capital. You know, I, I saw um, Charles Moldau, um, you know, was one of your investors, you know, Norwest, Renren. These are companies that have all invested in the marketplace lending space as well. You also got, you know, Goldman and JP Morgan. I, I guess I've got a couple of questions here. Firstly, 
you know, where are you on the path to profitability? I mean, you, you've been going a few years now. Are you, are you profitable? And uh, that's my first question. And then, you know, what are your IPO plans? Well, the whole profitability question depends on, you know, how quickly you want to grow and, and, and do you want to keep driving further? So we're thinking about taking parts of our business international. Mm-hmm. So those questions are always hard because it really depends on what, what path are you on. And we're, we're on a path to really optimize around growth versus profitability at this point. Okay. And, and for us, it really is about really just we, we launched our institutional business late last year. We want to get that out. Uh, our IPO business kickstarted in December. We want to keep scaling that business. So I think we're we're pretty early on. We've raised a lot of money. Thankfully, we haven't spent a lot of money. <laughs> so we're we're well capitalized right now. And you know, I never know about the IPO question. Uh, I mean, even it's, it's we we end up talking to a lot of issuers because we want them their their product on our platform. But we're we're just focused on kind of scaling the business, and we'll we'll figure that out when we go in. And I think the you know we picked our investors by design. Uh, when we started the company in 2011, you know, fintech. Uh, wasn't as uh, kind of fintech kind of ebbs and flows in terms of excitement. Uh, mm-hmm. But when we started, wasn't excited, and we mm-hmm. wanted to find notable investors and and board members that had taken companies public. As you mentioned, you know, our investors took financial engines public, uh, lending club public, uh, investnet public. So we wanted to find investors that really knew the space. But we also wanted to bring in people who who, who really understood the regulatory complexity of this space, because it is really hard to innovate in a regulated industry, right? Mm -hmm. Your product doesn't just go viral like an Uber does. You really got to spend time, especially as you think about an international play, for example, to go in. So, you know, we're we're very proud of of the group of investors we brought together because they've they've got a lot of experience. They help us think through a lot of the, the, the familiar issues that translate, whether you're in the lending marketplace side or uh, or in our case, when you're on the asset management side. Right, right. So then where do you see your future? Is your is, is your future going to be more and more individual investors? You said you, you talked about early adopters, and obviously, you know, you've got 300 plus thousand investors. Are you, do you thinking, I'm thinking about where, where is the mass scale going to come from? Because, you know, we've had this, we've had this conversation in the market waste lending space, which is, a, there's lots of similarities here. As far as sort of the the, the life cycle of of, of what you, where you've come from, do you do you feel like scaling the individual side is really your your future, or is it more of the institutional type deals like the one you did with uh, with Goldman with US Bank? Where, where's your future? So I think the the easiest path to scaling your business is definitely on the institutional side, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the US. The answer is different uh, in other parts of the world. So that is going to be our focus in terms of scale, growth, and all. We're growing our retail business healthy. It just takes time. And it's expensive, as you can imagine. Uh, Acquisition costs in this space uh, are high. We've found interesting ways to bring down those costs that are pretty exciting for us. And again, we we try to do things that are very well differentiated. I I wake up in the morning making sure everything we do at Motif can't be easily cloned because this is a an industry where the, the, the big incumbents are, are fast followers. And if, if, if they can replicate what, you do, what you've taken your years to figure out in months, that's just not a business you want to be in. So right. part of it is really partnering with the industry on things we can do pretty well. And, and I think our institutional business will scale at a very different rate than our retail business. That said, there is a lot of synergies between the two. So our uh, our, our underwriting uh, and selling group business, for example, we offer those shares to our retail customers. And I think what you'll see is, a, a, you know, the best business models in FinTech really have to optimize around the cross-sell. Uh, it's really hard to be a single featured product and get the economic model to work. You really need multiple uh, revenue streams to go in because it's also a very cyclical market. Mm-hmm. You know, we're coming out of one of the worst IPO markets, for example. So if that's all you did, uh, you'd be in very you know, big trouble uh, if, you, if that was all you did last year. Uh, and so part of it is there, there, there are different market cycles associated with them, but they, are, they do go together very nicely in that, you know, a lot of the products we're building for institutions, for example, we want to put on our retail platform. And as our retail platform gets bigger, uh, we start to be a distributor, not just a manufacturer on the institutional side. Right. That, 
makes sense. Okay, so we're just about out of time, but I'd like to sort of finish up with sort of the more immediate future. And what are your what are you working on right now? What are your what are your plans for for twenty seventeen that you can share? Well, you'll have to come to lend it to find <laughs> out because <laughs> we're going to be there. Uh, but I think I think we're you know we've touched on some of it. We're going to continue to offer products that are very differentiated and and that can't be replicated. And, and, and our institutional business and our IPO business launched late last year. Obviously, they're going to be, uh, we're going to be growing those businesses, but especially with the, 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 the institutional side, we're, we're going global very quickly. So mm-hmm. expect to hear some news around us now, not just being U.S. focused, but going to Europe, going to Asia. We're going to take that business global very quickly. So you'll see that in the news pretty soon. Okay, well, it's fascinating. You've got a, you're a really interesting business, uh, Hardeep. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay, see ya. Bye bye. One of the things that struck me in this interview was that Motif is actually going through some of the same challenges that many of their of their fintech cousins in the marketplace lending space are going through or have been through. And you know, the, the challenge of scaling a retail investor business versus you know, scaling an institutional business that is going to really be a lot less costly and potentially provide a, a you know a faster path to growth. It's interesting that that is the, the, the path that Motif is going down as well. And as Hardeep said in the interview that he's going to be at Lendit, he's going to be making an announcement there. I'd like to take this opportunity to let everybody know that go to Lendit.com. If you haven't bought a ticket yet, you should do so as soon as possible. Prices are going up shortly. Lendit will be on March 6th and 7th in New York City. I'll be there. Hardeep will be there. And pretty much every leader in the, the fintech world will be there. And I hope to see you there. Anyway, on on that note, I will sign off. Uh, I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.